And now, our feature presentation. Gunshot solves a medical mystery. What are these people looking at? You'll be amazed. This ski jump is very beautiful and spectacular, and obviously too dangerous for you to try. with a lot more that's incredible. Tonight, something more than incredible, something impossible. The temperature of this molten aluminum is 1,600 degrees. Now, the temperature of Mike Sharkozy's hand is 98.6. Tonight, you'll see Mike pass his hand through a stream of molten metal. I'm Fran Tarkenton. <laughs> with a question that has intrigued people for years. Will identical twins separated at infancy grow up different or alike? Tonight we'll meet a pair of twins named Jim who were separated for 39 years. I'm Kathy Lee Crosby. In certain parts of the world, the cockroach is a gourmet delight. But these are New York cockroaches. And tonight we're going to tell you everything you always wanted to know about the cockroach and probably a little more. <laughs> it's not incredible for a man to jump out of a plane at 12,000 feet, but Steve Baker's gonna jump out of this plane backwards. And handcuffed. And in a police restraining jacket. That's incredible. And there'll be a lot more that's incredible on. That's incredible. <laughs> That's incredible. What we're going to look like when we get old is a subject that interests all of us. Conceptual artist Nancy Burson has been experimenting with a technique that would project a human face any number of years into the future. With a camera attached to a computer, she was able to demonstrate changes involved in the aging process. Here's a sample of Nancy Burson's remarkable technique. This young lady is 19, and we're going to watch her age by a number of decades. You know, the computer has a sophisticated program which is able to literally age younger features before our eyes. This young man is 28. He didn't believe he'd age like this, but when he saw the final picture, he said it looked like his grandfather. Well, pretty soon Nancy Burson's machine will be available to the general public. Does it go backwards as well as forwards? Absolutely. <laughs> I choose backwards. <laughs> You know, you would think that being one of the most disliked creatures on the face of the earth, the cockroach would be extinct by now. But he isn't. In fact, the cockroach has been around virtually unchanged for 300 million years. One of nature's true success stories. And while cockroaches are disgusting to us, 
They're the delight of entomologists, those who study insects. They are an animal that's very easy to study. They're the type of animal that can answer a lot of questions. Although it took several years of nightmares for me to get used to working with these creatures. The sight of a bunch of cockroaches is enough to send chills down nearly anyone's spine. But in a rooftop greenhouse at New York's Museum of Natural History, cockroaches are the object of a special study by entomologist Dr. Betty Faber. I'm in this greenhouse because it is filled with wild cockroaches. How do you go about studying wild cockroaches? Well, you do have to come in and look at them a lot at nighttime, but you really can't tell them apart. So I'm here to label the cockroaches. You may think that this is just a filthy mayonnaise jar. To me, it's a cockroach trap. I usually put a little piece of rotten or rotting banana in the bottom. It has a really delightful odor, at least as far as cockroaches are concerned. They crawl up the side of the jar, they fall in to get the rotten banana, and then they can't get out because I have put Vaseline around the inside lip. I'm now going to put adhesive labels on it, one on the top part and one on the wing. By looking at loose roaches, I've learned all sorts of things. I've learned that males and females act very differently at night. Females go in a lot earlier than males, and males seem to just sort of hang around after midnight. I've learned that cockroaches tend to stay in one particular spot. I was rather surprised to learn this. I thought they would be all over the place. But you can go back night after night and find your same numbered individuals in the very same locations. I'll show you a few of my more popular experimental animals. This one, perhaps, is my favorite. These are feeling rather frisky today. These are the... Um, hissing cockroach from Madagascar and goes under the scientific name of Gramphata rhinoportentosa. You may be able to hear this little one hissing. These particular animals are favorite pets for entomologists because they're quite harmless and many people find them very frightening so you can scare all of your colleagues with these cockroaches. This is your common garden variety cockroach. The cockroach that occurs in just about everybody's kitchen, at least in the city of New York and many places in the Northeast. Cockroaches are a nice little bundle of fat and protein that make a very attractive source of food for a lot of animals. I've never thought that cockroaches were really attractive as a, as a food source, but there are people in the world that eat them. I have heard that in the Far East, people stuff cockroaches with all this spicy stuff and then serve them live on a platter and catch them with their chopsticks. Cockroaches have a rather interesting sex life that tends to make them even more difficult to get rid of. Female cockroaches, when they first molt, produce this odor that male cockroaches think is just wonderful. Eventually, the male backs into a female and they are mated. He gives her a supply of sperm that may last four or five months or may last her entire adult life. Therefore, if you get rid of the males in the population, you don't cure the problem at all because one male around just once can make the females fertile almost forever. People are always surprised to learn that cockroaches are really pretty clean animals. They're covered with this exoskeleton, and on this exoskeleton are little spikes and pores, and it is through these pores that they really perceive the world. Therefore, it behooves them to keep themselves clean, and they're constantly cleaning themselves. Generally, they are about as dirty as their surroundings. If your house is absolutely filthy, your cockroaches will be absolutely filthy. The great thing about working with roaches is they're cheap, and they're plentiful, and when they die, you just throw them away. <laughs> there goes 279. After seeing that piece of film, we want to know more about cockroaches, and we were sure you would too. So we invited an expert, entomologist Dr. Betty Faber. <laughs> Betty, you brought some wonderful samples with you today. Why do you study cockroaches? Well, I love to study cockroaches because I don't have to come in on the weekend to water them. And for me, that's just great. <laughs> Why are cockroaches such a successful species? Because they happen to like the same things that people like. 
at least these few species of cockroaches do. Like what? Nice warm apartments, <laughs> an occasional empty beer can. <laughs> they love those All things. Right. Could we take some out? Would it, you? Okay, I brought a whole slew of cockroaches, Let all different see. kinds. Yes. We can and see that. This particular one is the one from Madagascar oh, that was so on handsome. that film. Yes. Now this. Here, here's one for you. Yeah, that's nice. It makes a real hissing sound. I don't like spiders and snakes. No, well, you don't have to they make an angry. Sound. I never knew that. These, These are from sound? Samoa. These are from Madagascar. Right here, from Madagascar. Here, right here. Oh, I get to hold them too. Sure. Oh, that's true. Oh. Okay, got it. Oh, okay. he's right oh, there. Right now, right what? Here. He's a trooper. <laughs> what are these little bugs in here? Well, now, this was a blessed event. One of the mother cockroaches in this particular jar, her egg case hatched on the plane on the way over here. So these are baby cockroaches. Oh, no. that's amazing. Look at that. How many do they have at a time? This particular kind has 32 babies in an egg case. For sure. Well, they, this is lovely, and, and I really would like to thank <laughs> you. Lovely. Yes, they, they, no, they really like the little devils. They're real cute. I really thank Nobody's you. ever said that about my research before. <laughs> <laughs> When That's Incredible comes back, you'll find out how it feels to meet the twin brother you've been separated from for 39 years. And you'll see Steve Baker parachute from a plane at 12,000 feet. He'll be handcuffed and in a police restraining jacket. If he cannot escape within 28 seconds, he will not be able to pull the ripcord. To find out just how identical identical twins are, we invited identical twins to be with us. Would you welcome, please, Joanne and Jean Long. Joanne and Jean. Joanne and Jean? No, no. Jean, Jean and Joanne. I knew it was one or the other. I, thought, I almost memorized it during when I met you this afternoon by the, the freckles on your face. The only thing I can tell is different. Are you the same well, weight? No. no. Who's heavier? Me. Joanne. How come? I eat more. Do you exercise more? Yeah, I'm on a gymnastics team, so. You get more exercise? Yeah. Yeah. She eats. All right. <laughs> We're talking about two or three pounds, right, I assume. Yeah. No. Do, <laughs> oh my God. How to nail your sister on national television. <laughs> the whole thing here about twins feeling pain, if one person feels it. Have you ever experienced that? Yeah. You have? When I got my tonsils out, she would feel it. I had a sore throat for about two days. But you didn't have to have your tonsils no, out? No, no. Do you ever play tricks on your friends? Like Joanne would go and meet the guy, uh, and, and, then, and then next time Jean would show up? Yeah. <laughs> If she didn't like the guy and I did, I'd go and she'd stay home. Wouldn't that be, that's a fantasy. Wouldn't that be great? About the only way to measure the relative importance of heredity and environment is to study twins, especially when they've been separated. This happens very rarely, but last year, a set of identical twins who had been separated at the age of five weeks found each other after 39 years. Which is the strongest factor, heredity or environment? Were the twins the same? Were they different? At his home in Dayton, Ohio, a man tells us a little bit about himself. My name is James Springer. I was born in Pickwell, Ohio, on August 19, 1939. In Elida, Ohio, another man tells of his life. My name is James Edward Lewis. I was born in Pickwell, Ohio, on August 19, 1939. I've been married twice. The first wife's name was uh, Linda. The second wife's name was Betty. I have been married three times. My first wife was Linda. My second wife was Betty. And my present wife is Sandy. I have two adopted brothers, one by the name of Larry and one by the name of Gary. I have two adopted brothers, one named Larry and the other one named Tim. I have one son that is named James Allen Lewis. I have a son named James Allen. When I was in high school, my favorite subject was math. The best school subject I had was math. My favorite place to vacation is St. Petersburg, Florida. Favorite spot for vacationing was St. Petersburg Beach, Florida. I've had law enforcement training and various types of training in law enforcement. I went to a law enforcement school and did some special courses with the State Patrol Academy. And my favorite hobbies is carpentry and blueprinting. My hobbies are carpentry and blueprinting. I personally have a dog named Toy. When I was a child, I had a, a pet dog by the name of Toy. My favorite drink is Miller's Light and Pepsi. 
And the thing that I smoke most of all is, is a, a filtered cigarette. I smoke so a filtered cigarette and I drink uh, Miller's Light Beer. I have trouble with high blood pressure. Other than that, I have good health. I uh, have I have high blood pressure, brother, and my health's good. When Jim Lewis was being adopted, his mother overheard someone say they named the other little boy Jim too. Mm. Now, for many years, the remark tugged at it, and from time to time, she'd suggest that why doesn't Jim find out if he did indeed have a twin? And finally, Jim did. Last year, he contacted the court where his adoption papers were filed. Jim Springer's parents were then contacted. They told their Jim about the call, and a few days later, an emotional reunion took place. Today, Jim Springer and his family make frequent visits to the home of their new relatives. The two families have grown ever closer. they found that they share many common interests, and have developed between them a powerful bond of love. This is especially true for the reunited brothers always felt in their lives a certain undefinable lack. Now, well, there was, there's always been something all my life missing. It just wasn't quite complete. And until, until after the first time we met, and that, that never had that feeling since. And when we met one another, it was, it was uh, not like he was meeting a stranger for the first time. It was really a brotherly feeling. There is evidence of telepathic powers here a couple weeks ago, Jim was supposed to come up to my house, and I knew he wasn't going to make it up. For some reason, I just had a feeling he wasn't going to make it. And the night before that he was supposed to come up, he called and said he was sick and he couldn't make it. We were on our way up here one Sunday afternoon, and um, Jim's shoulders started hurting him. And uh, when we got here, Jim had told us that his, he had sprained his shoulder at work. There's been several incidents, like little things. You know, it does make you wonder. There isn't something there. Everyone in both families has found that their lives have been somehow enriched. Both sides of families get along just beautiful. It's, uh, it's, it's really amazing how everyone does get along, just like one big happy family. Everyone just found a whole new family. For Jim and for his brother, the experience of reuniting has been a source of incredible joy. What about you, ma'am? Do you believe identical twins are totally alike? I most certainly do. Huh. How about you? No way. <laughs> She's always wrong. <laughs> We were recently told about a very unusual building. Uh, you won't believe the weird way that it attracts customers. And if that doesn't whet your appetite, we might mention that it also involves 50 tons of creeping, crawling concrete. There's something incredible here that's catching people's eyes. Wow. I don't know. I've never seen anything like that before. That's incredible. We're at the Arden Way Shopping Center in Sacramento, California. Here, there's an unusual building that doesn't seem to have any windows or any doors. One corner of the building looks like it might have been damaged. Bricks have an appearance of a slightly darker shade of gray, and four of them are mysteriously missing. Nearly every day, at a little before 10 a.m., People can be seen there just waiting for something to happen. Hey, it is opening! Look! It's opening now! <laughs> this 50-ton notch of sliding concrete is the world's most incredible door. It's the entrance to the Best Products building, a catalog showroom. I've never seen a building do this before, not a store, anyway. Not this early in the morning. Every evening at 9 o'clock, the door puts the building to bed. With time-lapse photography, the three-minute process takes place in a matter of seconds. At the end of our show last week, we told you that Steve Baker was going to pull off an incredible escape. And I'm sure you're all wondering how he made out. So here's the incredible story as it took place near Lake Elsinore, California. Steve Baker, one of the world's most daring escape artists, is about to risk his life. But first, he must give his parachute a final close check. 
The cameras are nearly ready. And for all involved, the tension of anticipation is beginning to build. All right, Bobby. About ready to do this? Ready. Okay, Bob. Can you turn around here? Take off the cape. Okay. Soon, Steve Baker will make a death-defying free-fall parachute jump. His equipment, however, will not be completely standard. He will leave the plane handcuffed. In order to open his parachute, Steve will first have to free himself from the handcuffs while falling through space. Once his parachute is completely strapped on, the handcuffs will be locked to his wrists. But that's just one of the things that Steve will have to contend with. Is you all in? Yeah. Okay. The handcuffs are locked on by a police officer. Standard police cuffs. They have a double lock on them. One is the ratchet, which we just gripped. The other is the locking key on the back plate. I now have been double locked into a set of handcuffs. He's now going to place a transport jacket over the top of this. This is a transport jacket. It's what they use to transport prisoners who are a lot of trouble. They handcuff him and place him in this very unit. The constraining jacket is wrapped around Steve's body as tightly as is physically possible. The moment of truth is drawing closer. gradually ascends to an altitude of 12,000 feet, Steve's crew makes their final preparations for the daring jump. Everyone feels the tension now. Everyone but Steve. The plane has nearly reached the critical altitude. Steve Baker must now face the greatest risk he has ever taken. If he succeeds, he will set a world's record that few will be eager to challenge. Part of Steve's crew will also jump. They'll stabilize his fall and film the event. It's almost time to go. The plane is now in position. Once he leaves the plane, Steve Baker will have less than half a minute to free himself from the handcuffs and the restraining jacket, and then open his parachute. If he doesn't do it in time, Steve could easily lose his life. is about to risk his life. He is handcuffed and bound in a restraining jacket. Once he jumps, he'll have 28 seconds to free himself and then open his chute. He's off. Two jumpers hold him to keep him from spinning. Ten seconds have elapsed. He still isn't out of the handcuffs. There, he's out. Ten seconds to go. He's got the jacket off, just in time. His life now depends on the parachute. He did it. Way to go, Steve. Come on, come on, please. Good, 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 good. On the ground, it's time for celebration. stories deal with the sensational, the unexplained, and the unexplored. 
We're also interested in stories which deal with relationships. For instance, the incredible relationship between humans and dogs. Our next story is one of those. It's about a man named C.C. and a dog named Chester. And a medical miracle. Chester began limping here for a couple of days and they always kept watching him and he, he finally just fell down. When in fact, we thought he had a heart attack. He couldn't walk, he couldn't drag, or anything. he just gave up. So we had to carry him and load him in the automobile, take him over to Dr. Ralston. We didn't think we'd ever bring him back home. We thought that he'd have to put him to sleep. We got over to the vet. We had to unload him, carry him in like a baby. And uh, Dr. Ralston looked at him. And, you know, I said it once, and said, well, we'll treat him with this aquapodge. The story of Chester is that he came in in a lot of pain and was uh, totally paralyzed his back end, and he had no control over his bowels or his kidneys. And uh, the gentleman was very depressed about his uh, chances of survival. So after I talked to him for a while about it, we decided to go ahead with acupuncture. Okay, we're gonna put these needles into these particular points. And the reason we use this particular point here is because uh, Chester's problem is basically lack of circulation uh, circulation that's necessary to heal this. For example, this point we're treating right here uh, is on the bladder meridian and it's the kidney association point. It causes the animal to secrete his own cortisone to help in overcoming this condition. We're ready to start giving him from what we call microcurrent. The ancient Chinese said, we have one disease, congestion, one cure, circulation. And if we look at that from the standpoint of uh, acupuncture, we can see how we could take a point above a, a place where there was congestion and a point below a place where there was congestion and then flowing energy back and forth between these two points then we have a, a very good chance to open this, break up the congestion and open up this channel of energy flow so that the body can cure itself. And that's what it's all about. But he got him on his feet and he got so he could stand. And then he got so he'd to hold his tail a little bit, he could walk, just, just really walk. He's kept improving, improving, and he's doing real well. He's walking, he's running from one side of the yard to the other. We love the old dog. At the end of every show, we ask you to let us know if you've seen or done anything incredible. Well, the mail has been pouring in. We received this letter from North Judson, Indiana. My name is Mike Sarkozy, Jr., and I have a very incredible dad. There, there's a lot of people that'll come up and hear about it and ask me if it's so, I tell them, but they still won't believe it. And about the only way they can believe it is if they see it. And about the only way they can, I can show it to them is to go through the procedure and let them see it, and then what they see is what they believe. Mike, Jr. continues. I've seen my dad do his little thing for years. Now this is it. He passes his bare hand through melted metal. He does this just for the fun of it. And I know he would enjoy doing it for your show. A minute. Uh -oh. uh, this We're in Mike Sarkozy's foundry in Knox, Indiana. Mike is 62 and has worked in a foundry for over 40 years. In that time, he's learned a lot about handling molten metal and has gained a rare knowledge of its secrets and its dangers. All right, now I'm gonna flash it to see if it's hot enough and then we'll check it with the probe. All right, looks good enough now. Let me check it with your pyrometer to see if the temperature's up there. Ah, uh, she's about 1400. The younger men at the foundry have an enormous respect for Mike Sarkozy's knowledge and experience. 
He can do things with red-hot molten metal, seemingly magical things, that few men would ever dare try. Now, don't raise up yet. Okay, you, you get ready with your handle. Where's the safety pin? Okay. The pot contains molten aluminum. Its temperature is 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll instantly set a stick on fire. But what about Mike's finger? Watch. Let's see that in slow motion. Mike puts his finger right through it. Fearless Mike Sharkozy will even put his entire hand directly through the super hot liquid metal. Watch. Remember, the temperature of the metal is 1600 degrees. Mike's hand is hot, but not injured. Oh, give me your cigarette. I'm dying for a smoke. There's one final touch to the performance. Lighting a cigarette with the spilled molten metal. Amazingly, Mike's hand has not suffered in the slightest. Thank you, Mike. That was incredible. And here's the man who wrote us. Mike Sharkozy, Jr., and here's the man he wrote about, his dad, Mike Sharkozy Sr. Thank you, Mr. Sharkozy, how long have you been doing this? Oh, about 46 years, ever since I was 16 years old. At 16, you tried this? Right, I started off in a foundry as an apprentice, and I seen my supervisor do this. And I figured if he can do it, I'll try it. So when he wasn't around, I tried it. I got more durable. I kept doing it more often, and he caught me. What'd he do? Fired me. <laughs> <laughs> What's the secret? There is no secret, but like with me, I've done it so long, I know my metal. The metal has to be perfectly pure. I mean, there can't be no impurities in it. If there are impurities in the molten metal, what would happen to your hand? Well, all right, that impurity in that metal if I don't clean it. Mm -hmm. And when I run my hand through it, it'll stick just like tar or honey. And, and burn, burn it. And it'll and burn the flesh off. <laughs> Mike and Mike, thank you very much for being with us. It was a pleasure. When we come back, you'll see how the study of blood spatters on a wall helps solve a crime. And we'll have an update on another incredible police procedure. Some weeks ago, we showed you this reconstruction of a murder victim's skull. Since that time, the victim has been identified. This looks like blood, but it isn't. It's the liquid mixture used to simulate blood in motion pictures. But it looks enough like real blood to have been used in a series of incredible experiments. As a result of these experiments, a murder was uncovered and solved. But this wasn't in the movies. It was the real thing. At the Orlando, Florida coroner's office, blood spatter expert Judy Bunker. When teaching this technique, we try to demonstrate what happens with blood. Uh, what happens when blood drops or falls? This is blood that is dropped from a three-foot height. Directionality when a person is bleeding and moving from one room to another? Are they heading in a westerly direction? Are they standing still? What happens when a bloody object strikes a surface? You can move the table away and still come back, look at your vertical target and put them back together like a picture puzzle. And we want to demonstrate a gunshot wound. What type of spatter effect do we expect to see? effect is of a much higher degree. 
This technique is utilized by many law enforcement agencies and medical examiner's offices in the interpretation of a scene, in the interpretation or reconstruction of circumstances involving bloodshed. In November of 1970, this house was the scene of a violent death. Michelle Cooper, the woman who lived here, reported to the police that a man she knew had committed suicide in her bedroom. The Winter Park, Florida police carefully investigated the case. It was ruled a suicide and forgotten until the case was re-examined by Detective Neil Troutman. Some six, uh, six and a half years later, I was reviewing cases uh, contained in our records division and happened to come across this particular case file. Uh, while reading it, uh, I sensed that uh, something just uh, was not right. Detective Troutman reopened the case and enlisted the help of Judy Bunker. The original report indicated that Michelle Cooper had been asleep in an adjacent bed when the young man shot himself. After hearing the shot, she awoke to find him falling on the floor between the beds. The victim was found with a gunshot wound in the right side of his head, which had exited out of it the left side of his head, and the bullet then lodged in the pillow. It appeared from the photograph that the staining was continuous, which would indicate to me that the pillow had not been moved and was in this position at the moment bloodshed occurred. In one of the photographs, there was one item resting across the back of his head. It was a telephone cord. It was apparent to me that if the phone cord had been in this position or in this area, it would have been underneath the body, since as the body is rolling off of the bed, the phone cord would be trapped underneath his head. And when we were reconstructing this scene, we kept the phone cord in position to prove that when he went off of the bed and hit the stool and then the floor, he always trapped the cord underneath him. And certain stains we saw on the clothing did not match that one would expect to see with a gunshot. We felt that the phone was uh, in the vicinity of the victim on the floor at the time. And when the phone was moved, the cord came in contact with the subject laying on the floor. This impression stains, I felt, was compatible with the phone cord. The stains seen on the opposite bed were consistent with a person bleeding uh, and rolling off the bed, striking the footstool and then the floor. We were easily able to reconstruct these stains. Using a live subject to recreate in exact detail the events of the supposed suicide, the investigators duplicated almost perfectly the patterns of blood spatter shown on the original police photographs. So we felt certain then that he in fact did roll off the bed or was turned off the bed uh, and impacted with the footstool and then the floor. After we placed our subject in position, the position we felt was most compatible with the stains, we asked the medical examiner, Dr. Hager, to place the gun in proper position, the trajectory necessary. And when this was accomplished, our subject was unable to reach his hand up and grab a hold of the revolver and fire it. So we knew then that only another person could have been holding on to the weapon when it was discharged. Uh, I subsequently brought this to the grand jury and presented it in photographic form so that they could understand it. And when they saw by photograph that it was physically impossible for this subject to shoot himself in this position on the bed, they then returned an indictment against her. The, actually, the case was scheduled for trial, but the defendant pled guilty that particular morning and never did actually go to trial. What you saw may have seemed grisly, but it was effective in bringing the murders to justice. Some of you thought our story about the reconstruction of the human skull was equally gruesome, but it too has been instrumental in helping solve a crime. Here's an update on that story. To refresh your memory, these are the details. In the autumn of 1979, Dale Prinsick was grouse hunting in the woods of northern Wisconsin. Suddenly he came upon two dead bodies, partially decomposed and completely unrecognizable. In Marinette, Wisconsin, the local county seat, an investigation was begun by Chief Deputy Robert Coleman. He was faced with a difficult problem. How do you identify a human body when there are no fingerprints and no witnesses to the murder? 
the police looked for help from an unusual new source. A unique method of identification was performed by medical artist Betty Gatliff and University of Oklahoma anthropology professor Dr. Clyde Snow. The technique is known as facial reconstruction. With the skull of an unidentified person and a knowledge of their sex, race, and approximate age, the face of that person can be accurately recreated. It's a painstaking process that can take several days, but it has often been successful. Dr. Snow offers his conclusions about the mysterious Wisconsin case. Uh, my conclusions and those of Professor Bennett was that this is uh, the skull of an adult female, probably somewhere in her upper 20s or up to about 40 years of age. Five foot three to five foot six, white, with probably a strong to moderate American Indian admixture. I uh, hope that they'll use all three. I think they should print all three. We need a profile. In February of this year, photographs of the skull were published. Since receiving the information from Betty Gatliff, uh, we've released the photos to the press and have received several positive responses. We are very hopeful at this time that we are going to be able to identify her. Several weeks ago, we showed you these pictures and asked if anyone could supply any information regarding the identity of this mysterious murder victim. Well, now there's more to the story. A chain reaction triggered by the newspaper photograph of Betty Gatliff's startling recreation of the murdered woman brought a dramatic new development to this baffling mystery. The woman has been identified. Her name was Mary Bartels from Saginaw, Michigan. She was 29 years old and the mother of two. Now with this new knowledge, Chief Deputy Robert Coleman and his men could in time apprehend the person who shot Mary Bartels and her daughter and close the case. And here's the Chief Deputy of Marinette County, Wisconsin, Robert Coleman. <laughs> Bob, may I call you Bob? What were the actual steps which led to the identity of the murdered woman? Well, John, our department received information from a young man who was hospitalized in Marquette, Michigan. While there, he received a newspaper containing the photographs of the facial reconstruction. We saw that newspaper picture, yeah. He showed the photographs to several other patients at the hospital. and One of them thought that she recognized the woman as a former co uh, companion of hers from Bay City, Michigan. Is that right? We contacted the Bay City Police, and they, being close to Saginaw, knew that Saginaw had two missings who closely resembled our victims. Uh, we contacted Saginaw, exchanged information, and ultimately identified our victims. We'll be back in just a moment to pay our respects to a lady named Anna Jarvis and a flock of folk named Luke, who are branches of a most incredible family tree. Anna Jarvis was a feisty little woman whose perseverance paid off in 1914 when the Congress of the United States officially recognized what has become one of our favorite annual celebrations, Mother's Day. By a happy coincidence, we recently filmed this story of an American family who personify that sentimental holiday in an endearing and, yes, incredible manner. And it all begins with this chubby little toddler. Five-month-old Matthew Luke tied a world record just by being born. His mother, Kimberly, was justifiably proud. So was his father, Mr. Mark Luke. So were the other members of the Luke clan. Marilyn and Gloria Miller, Matthew's maternal grandparents. Warren and Wilma Luke, Matthew's paternal grandparents. Dr. Ernest and Elsie Hoffer, Matthew's maternal great-grandparents. William and Sarah Shankle, Matthew's paternal great-grandparents. John and Edith Miller, Matthew's other great-grandparents, along with Charles and Dorothy Luke, and Mabel Luke, Matthew's great-great-grandmother. Matthew has a record number of 15 ascendants, five generations in all. Recently, they posed for a group photograph. Matthew and 89-year-old great-great-grandma Mabel were the guests of honor. Grandma Mabel hasn't seen Matthew since shortly after he was born. It's time for the photograph now. I want you to 
wink again. Wink again, one more time. <laughs> we know who we are from our roots. Um, I know that on both sides, Kim's family and Mark's family, there are family trees that go back to the 1500s on both sides. For generations, we know who we are. Great-great-grandmother Mabel Luke can still vividly recall her early homesteading days in Loretta, South Dakota. That time set the stage for the latest chapter of this truly incredible family. We would like to extend our best wishes to the Luke family and to your families. And to our families, we wish them a wonderful Mother's Day, and most especially to each of our own mothers and my grandmother. How many times have you tried to break that habit? My name is Joey Winters. I'm 38 years old. I've come all the way from California to Baltimore to quit smoking. I've been smoking for 25 years and I'm ready to quit. With the help of this cure and this doctor, I can throw away cigarettes forever. The, the solution that I inject into the patients is a solution that I make from various known solutions, solutions of vitamins, solutions of minerals, solution of procaine. You put them together at the right proportion, and that is what's injected. In the weeks to come, we'll follow Dr. Neil Solomon's five cases of serious smokers who are trying a last-ditch cure. Will it work? Next week, it'll be business as usual. The incredible business of risking life and limb to bring you what you've never seen before. Dar Robinson is firing up his motorcycle to make an incredible jump over 30 vans. And what happens to him in midair is even more incredible. We'll hear the mating call of that racy garden Romeo, the snail. And you'll meet this fine young athlete. She's a track star, despite the fact that she is totally blind. There's a revolutionary way to renovate your teeth and give you a Hollywood-type smile. You'll see. And remember, if any of you have seen something incredible or do something incredible yourself, we'd like to hear from you. Drop us a line at Post Office Box 25989, Los Angeles, zip code 90025, and please include your telephone number. Thank you, and a special thanks to WDTN-TV in Dayton, Ohio, WRTV, Indianapolis, Indiana, and WLUK, Green Bay, Wisconsin, for their contributions to our program. Thank you, everybody, and good night. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Good night. That's my boy that said that. <laughs> Thursday night is loaded with laughs on ABC. Mark could wind up attached to a ball and chain when he helps a jailbird fly the coop on Mark and Mindy. Then Marcy goes to pieces when a beautiful blonde goes after her job on Benson. On Friday, the woman who knows the stars best, Hollywood columnist Rona Barrett presents Bo Derek, Larry Hagman, Kenny Rogers, Christy McNichol, and their mothers in an exciting behind-the-scenes Mother's Day special, That's My Mom. Later, watch a hilarious romantic comedy. Six singles seeking love bear their desires at a video dating service, the newest way to find a mate. Enjoy the love tape starring Loretta Swift, Larry Wilcox, Marriott Hartley, and Martin Balsam. A world television premiere this Friday on ABC. Incredible.